um, at the end of the presentation. I know we're getting there, but I, I left a whole variety for you guys of um, foods like that you can use in your brews. Um, we might not get to everyone today, but I pulled my hair out trying to find recipes, and, and it's all in my presentation for you. Um, a recipe for a five gallon brew, a recipe for a 12 gallon brew, 50 gallon brew, 100 gallon brew, 250 gallons. And um, I traditionally have been buying these prepackaged foods for 200 gallon brew, and they're like, say, 50 bucks. I've been trying to experiment and going back through some old records to try to find how much, like I say, fish and how much. Um, molasses, very inexpensive sources to try to get my food costs down because you can spend a lot of money on these foods. And, uh, but you know, for the new person, it's not a bad idea to buy these food packs so you really know what you're doing. Question? I have yeah. a question again. Yeah, I've got, uh, I'm a little uh, mystified about a five gallon brew. How well, that's How a five-gallon brew there? right yeah. there. What area do you cover with that? Um, well, I use that more like if I'm planting annuals or a few perennials. You know, um, that, that brews pretty strong tea, so I will cut that in half. Mm -hmm. I'll just dip my root right in there and just jam it in the ground. Mm -hmm. Stuff like that, you know. That's kind of what I use it for. Um, it's not going to go a heck of a long way on a 10,000 square foot lawn, but, but again, I give you a recipe back. Of, I use 100 gallons on an acre. So a 10,000 square foot lawn, what do I use, 25 gallons, something like that? You know? Yep, that's what I use. Yeah. So, so there are, um, again, it's in there, 25 gallons per acre. I do straight tea. Some people cut it in half, but I can. I do straight tea only because I got these giant brewers, and, and I'm, I think as long as you don't cut your tea by more than a third. Like in the old days, they were saying you could cut the tea ten times and stuff like that. That's that's not true. You know, um, never don't cut your tea by more than thirty-three percent, like a third. You know. Mm -hmm two-thirds water to one-third tea. Otherwise, as a tool, I, it's just not effective. Uh, the aeration can keep the brew going aerobic in a higher temperature. Um, <clears throat> the extraction is the water movement. Extraction, what you're doing, you're actually pulling the microorganisms off the compost with the air is what you're doing when you brew compost tea. So it's sitting in this sack, it's sitting in this sack, your compost is in there, you know, I have my worm castings, I have my household compost, and I put a, I put a few organic rabbit manure and straw in there. I have this farm around in Pennsylvania, and I, I buy bags of this organic rabbit manure from him. So I have the three sources in there, and you run, like, this just blows air up. You could even use air stones from a fish tank, and I just sit that up there, and the air running through there rips the fungi and the bacteria off the compost, and that's what's in your, suspended in your water. Now when I add the fish and the molasses or your food source, that's what you're growing out, this bacteria and the fungi, <laughs> along with some protozoa and amoeba and, and, and you know, it's, it's pretty cool. And again, unless you're looking under a microscope, you really don't know what you have. So would you use that, that single bag for like a 250 gallon uh, tank? Um, my 250 gallon tank has a 20 quart bag. It's like um, 20 quarts is like um, it's that wide and about that high. Five times that. 
Yeah, about five, 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 five times that. So would that bag be overkill for that size? Oh, yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah. I just fill this like, right. um, I just fill the bottom corner like that, you know what I mean? And I just use the rest to tie it through up here. Um, in these little home systems, I never even used a bag before. The, the guy that sold me this, was like, it was like $125 for the system, but it proves really good tape. I can't believe it. He's like, I don't want to sell you those anymore. He goes, they only last two years, but I'm like, I can't believe that brew is much better tea than my big brewer. When you look under the scope, it's on my website, you'll see a couple super batches of tea, and that's from that little brewer. And again, you can go online, you can make homemade brew kit, <coughs> you can make a 350 gallon brewer um, from a drum. There's, there's all things you can do. It's fun. It's, it's just fun. Um, my wife, I'm sure, would prefer. My wife is like the brains of the operation, and she does all the books. And um, I think I've wasted, or not wasted, but experimented with so many different things. All the extra money goes right back into like buying stuff. and. She goes crazy. <laughs> she goes, this organic, you're not saving any money. I know. I said, but I'm having a heck of a good time. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's easier to live with. Yes. <laughs> so it's aerobic. Um, you know, you're giving a good amount of food to these desired organisms without driving that brew anaerobic. Too much food, like, that's why it's nice to buy the prepackaged amounts. You know you're not going to drive your tea. You can kill your tea. You, know, you can kill it with too much love. Um, when you're buying your brewer from your source, you talk to them about the foods, how much you think it would cost to do a brew for... Most people who sell brewers sell their own food packs with the, with the tanks. So you have an ongoing relationship with that vendor. Um, factors in making good compost tape. The quality of the compost itself. I mean, the compost is called the inoculum. You know, the better the compost, the better the tea. The more air you put in there, the better it's going to be. Uh, there's optimum temperatures to brew good tea. You can still brew tea, don't get me wrong, but the good tea is between 75 and 85 degrees. Um, We've talked a lot about different food sources, your sugars for your bacteria and your um, proteins, your fish for your fungi. The water source. Um, you know, the best water source that you can use is from a well that doesn't have any kind of dechlorinators in there. If you have a well, that's a wonderful thing that the water hasn't been treated. The next best thing, um, I thought pond water would be great because it's filled with little biology, but Chip was saying that some of that biology could actually contaminate the tea. So if you, if you don't have a well, just use you know, your tap water, but make sure to use the humic acid or some kind of dechlorinator to bust through the chlorine and the chloramines. Uh, the cleaning, you know, without good cleaning, you will not make good tea. The timing of your apps, well, rainy days is the best, but it will work in other times. Uh, the quality of your sprayer, you just, you don't want a sprayer <coughs> that is going to, the, the, the tea passes through the piston pump and destroy the biology of the tea. So you want like a diaphragm pump, you know, um, and from what I learned, a backpack sprayer, the openings are too small for that biology to really pass through. I'm not sure about backpack mist blowers, if they're any good or not, Barra, are they? For no, no. You want large openings, you know, large, like you could use a sub pump and just a hose and pour that tea, you coriate and pour that tea on the top and let it lay into those holes just like a liquid compost. Um, and you, and you would use a finer nozzle if you're going to be doing a foliar spray. 
as opposed to a soil drench, just common sense. Um, this is another slide that was just provided to me to help as a teaching tool. I have not used all these inoculums in my teas, but um, Barry might know trichoderma is a um, fungus, a naturally occurring fungus in compost that you can buy and add to your tea for certain applications. The mycorrhizal fungi, fungi, I think people are a little more familiar. Like I say with my lawn treatments, I use the endomycorrhiza. Uh, Buvaria, bar, um, it's for insects, I think. It's, yes, it's a naturally occurring fungus. The reason why you add them all is because they don't grow in a, in a compost tea. Okay. Now, they've used the Bavaria for chinch bug control, and it's, it's, it does supposedly a great job. Any experience I had with the products was for this Point Pleasant had a severe uh, chinch bug outbreak because they were using, so as soon as they went back to commercial fertilizers, they got a chinch bug outbreak, and the Bavaria was very expensive to treat 600,000 square feet. Um, the, the bacteria, these are just some naturally, again, occurring bacteria for certain specific applications that you can add to your job. Some of these nematode sprays, um, when you get your soil test back, you might find that you'll be lacking in some of these nematodes, and, and there are some nematode inoculants you can add. But uh, Chip Osborne was telling us about some nematodes that are um, good grub fighting, can have the capability to offset some grub damage. Again, I'm not going to make any claims about it, but um, you could do some research on that. Again, I wanted to put out that these inoculants are out there. The only one that I've used is the mycorrhiza. Um, but I've, ex I've looked into the Bavaria, and, uh, and I was going to buy some trichoderma for my vegetables, but uh, it just ended up, it was naturally occurring in my compost anyway. This is checking the tea. Um, this is just my own slide because I thoroughly believe that you should pick up a microscope and take a look under there. Otherwise, it's a 50-50 chance whether you're spraying real tea or brown water. I check my teas as it's brewing. I check my tea before it goes in the sprayer. And then I'll go out like um, in the field and grab the guy's been out there four hours. I'll grab a Gatorade thing and just put some tea in there, bring it home and take a look. Is the tea alive after four hours? And um, and then at the end of the day, I'll take some of that sludge that's in the bottom of the tank and take a look. And if I haven't added too many foods, additional foods, to spray, I can't believe how much biology is even left after eight hours. It's incredible. Just from sloshing around in the tank, getting some air. Like, um, on my website, you'll see my most biologically active tea was after 12 hours in a Gatorade jug on a 90 degree day. It has some anaerobic, like, um, they're just starting to set in these, um, I can't remember the name of the microorganisms, but they're dancing and they're spinning. They're trying to wake up the other microbes in the slide and they're spinning and trying to give them air. It's the most incredible thing I've ever seen and they're gyrating and bouncing into the other microbes to try to wake them up. They've already, you can see, died. And it's the coolest thing I've ever seen. Like, uh, so that's on my website if you're ever. I asked for people that professionally help me identify these microorganisms, and I just haven't done a blog post about it, but scientists from all over the country have actually written to me what exactly I'm looking at like stalk cilia, they're called. That's right, that's what they were. And um, again, it's a little bit of sign your T's going aerobic, but just fascinating. And, you know, a couple hundred dollar microscope. 
It took me thousands of dollars of classes how to learn how to use it. <laughs> I can't tell you. I went to Rodale University. I took a three-day microscope class. Um, I saw Elaine Ingham was doing a three-day microscope class. Um, there's this guy T. Fletcher and Paul Wagner tag team and do these microscope classes. Um, so, you know, you look for names uh, out there and you try to, you know, when you see a good organic name, try to get out there and see their education. <coughs> Um, okay, I know we're getting really close. You guys want to get going home. Just a couple little things. These are some of my recipes. This is a just a recipe for a five gallon. You could get an air pump like that for like 50 bucks. Some air hoses. Run it to a fish tank stone like that big. You know, two of those in the bottom of that thing. Pour two cups of balanced compost in there two tablespoons of kelp, a little bit of the uh, blackstrap molasses, a tablespoon, or, yeah, a tablespoon, a little bit of humic acid, and that'll brew that up in 24 hours. Here's a fungal-dominated compost tea, five gallons, if you're doing more shrubs, okay? Um, this is, what I call it the ultimate compost tea recipe. It's got everything, everything from the kitchen sink in there that's organic to help those microbes grow. Rock dust? What? Rock dust? Yeah, um, I use some rock dust powders, those minerals. They have the minerals that the soil is actually made up from. Um, I was actually buying this um, rock dust that was from a mine that was magnetized up in uh, Maine. And there's a farmer out in Long Island that swears by it. And actually, it looked like three-quarter grab, like a QP. Yeah, yeah. It had rocks and the gravel in there. And he would set it on top of his garden. <coughs> he would go back a week later, and it just gravity pulled the, the, uh, by the um, magnetic force of the rock, just pulled it right through the soil. He used it for aerating his fields. It was wild. Um, there's a guy up in New York State Compost Works. He swears by azomite in his compost tea recipes. That's another rock dust. Chip Osborne uses sea minerals. Um, he loves sea minerals. Five minutes, okay, we can do that. Here's a 100-gallon tea recipe. This is my recipe that I use for those 220-gallon brewers. And um, this is a couple of Elaine Ingham's recipes. Um, one last quick thing before we go is uh, compost extracts. A tea, you brew and you have to get out there in eight hours. An extract, you pull off the, the bacteria and the fungi off the compost and it's suspended in the water, but, it, but it's, you're not giving it foods, so it's not growing and, and out out, you know, out competing the water and the oxygen. So you can theoretically leave an extract out there for a week. And then when you're going to apply it, you apply your foods and then lay it out. A um, lot of research being done if that's a more effective way. I just don't see the biology in the extracts that I do. I'm not good enough to see the dormant biology yet, just that active biology, and I don't see it near as good as I do with the tea. Um, our goal is to reduce these inputs over time, sustainability, and create this process of nutrient cycling where um, you just, the, the soil organisms are doing the work for you. Insta I used to use four pounds of nitrogen a year, I'm down to about two pounds. I use this um, organic soy amino acid fertilizer and I mix a little bit of the sea minerals and I mix a little bit of molasses with it and um, four pounds does an acre and the stuff's like four dollars a pound so I can feed an acre for sixteen dollars, twenty dollars, you know, so um, When you were saying four pounds of nitrogen, were you uh, it's you four pounds of this fertilizer that's four dollars a pound. It's a 1600 soy 
It's not four pounds of nitrogen. Because I, I uh, did buy a bag of powdered nitrogen. Of what? Nitrogen. Just nitrogen to add. But that, what you're talking about is different. Probably. I mean, I, you live right up by me now. Put me to put that. I'll look at it for you. So, any questions? I got a question. When you started, how much tea did you say you put out each year or brew annually? Oh, well, I, I just started out. I, it's a funny story. I bought one of those 500 gallon or 250 gallon brewers. I'm doing Bergen Communities Fields. He went all hyped up. He went to a class. He had a brewer. He wasn't using it. I'm like, why don't you let me use your brewer and I'll feed your field. It's really cheap, you know? So he gave me his brewer. So now I got side by side 500 gallon brewers and I did brew 40,000 gallons of tea last year, which is a lot. I started doing my local athletic field, my local school, and now I'm up to 100 athletic fields with the core aeration and the tea and the organic. So I am making an impact in the state. A lot of schools cut back this year and I kind of got hurt, but um, I have to expand a little bit more into some residential work for a little more financial security, but my true passion is in a, the athletic fields. What's the latest you have planning on? Tea? Tea. Um, I was doing tea till like um, December 15th, I think we're still doing tea getting some late apps and all year round, March to December, yeah, as long as your stuff don't freeze. Remember then it got really cold, you know, it was like a warm end of November. So on a property, like a residential property, are right. you placing how many applications per year? Two, I do. It's just cost, you can't really do too so much more, but again, you want to be working on your pH and your organic matter, right? Mm -hmm. Then you start laying that biology in there. And how long do you wait? I got two questions for you. One, how long? What's the latest you'll spray something that you brew? Like uh, eight oh. hours is max. You got to get it out in eight hours. Like I brew it for 24 to 30. Yeah. Then, then the guys come in. We we got a pool pump we use now, like a pool pump separates out any wood, you know, it's great. This little yeah. pool pump. Fill up my tank and we get right out there and hit the lawns. I try to get it out in eight hours. I mean, that's standard is eight hours. You don't like to let it sit overnight trying to no, no, it for what's left. No, it's, you get no. Eight hours. Eight hours. You can but you could do the extract. Extract, you can do that, but not with the food. Just brew well, it, some, but don't give the food. As long as it's aerated, though. Because some people will they'll have say like like a two hundred fifty gallon thing and they uh, they might set themselves up for two days or one day they're doing turf and the second day they're doing really ornamental so they'll they'll take half the tea out and apply that that day whereas the half that's remaining is tea growing for the next forty eight hours and you get a more fungally dominated tea so you can do it that way too. Mike, I remember uh, and I'm actually helping remember um, from from Chip's course a few weeks ago. We were talking about how was he saying that he gets tries to get the organic matter content up to a certain level, and then after that he's just applying um, the teas. Were we having that conversation? What he said was um, the tea themselves won't put the organic matter in the soil. Okay. It'll put that biology in it. It'll put the fungi. Like I've been spraying lawns now four years. Oh, it's going to get the pH right. It's going to get this right. The biology will straighten everything out. No, the pH is still bad. I still need to adjust my pH, get it up to 6.5. I still need to do my top dressing with the compost. And then your compost tea will be really effective. Okay. You can do it, yeah. but it's not the same law. It's the all three together. Okay. Thank you. Well, one other question. Oh, one last question. No question. So, yeah, real briefly then, your turf program is um, two applications of tea and aerating with compost and four apps of this soy fertilizer. 
at a, um, like a half a pound per thousand. Like real okay, light so that's a different one. So yeah. That's yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's a six app program. Okay. But I try not to think that way. Six app. It's like what right. is needed. You know, I'll do the soil testing and and. But lawns do need nitrogen, you know. It needs a little bit of a for that to manage the expectations. Right. There's certain people I don't do any fertilizers for. It's only on those mania, you know. Right. Managing the expectations. Thank you. Thank sure. you. Sure. Right. Good chat. Thank you for today. Um, if you want to take a five minute. Bio break, stretch your legs, come back and we'll review the highlights of uh, yeah. today's.